narratives like some Americans look at Mexicans and some Canadians look at First Nations reserves. And just like most, Christ most Canadians have never visited a First Nations reserve and wouldn't really know how to find one, most Jews would never have set foot where Jesus was trapped. You know, we lose so much in our lives because we get so caught up in routines, go in the normal way. I mean, I don't know about you, sometimes when I have to drive somewhere else, I, I, I'll, I'll go the wrong way because I'm so used to going in the direction of Mount Zion, right? And soon I'll have to say, Paul, oh, where's you going? <laughs> sometimes we need to be open to the Spirit nudging us to walk in some new way or to look at an old situation in a new way. But of course, sometimes our inability to look at things in a fresh way or take a different way is because we're afraid. But opportunities come when we meet somebody new or see somebody or something in a new way. When we see people who come to hospitality as churches uh, throughout London provide hospitality as we support St. Paul's and theirs. And, and if you go to the different hospitality as you'll see that uh, about half of the volunteers there, they're really focused on getting that food out and serving it. But the other half aren't just feeding hungry people. They're looking at every person as a precious individual. And you can see, you know, they're the ones who say, oh, good to see you. How you been? They learn the, the regular things. And, and they're there serving food, but what they're really serving is a big dose of love. That, that's, that, that's having that extra fresh way of seeing what's going on around us. Seeing someone as precious as our brother and sister, that changes everything. Now we tend to think in categories, you know, homeless or poor or Jews or Samaritan natives, poor, Muslim, street professors, professors. But the reality is we're all family and we're all individuals. We all have a story. We all have a story of struggle and goodness. And going the road less traveled, keeping an eye out for people to connect with, that allows our divine power to flow. That allows our force to be what the Creator intends it to be, a force in motion. It increases our divine power to bless others and then to be blessed by their presence. Jesus never allowed his tasks to get in the way of building relationships and looking for ways to bless others. Oh, most of my life I was task focused. And if you got an interrupt my task, my tone wasn't very nice. Now I've learned a lot of interruptions are opportunities. It's a whole different way of looking at things. Jesus never allowed his task to get in the way. He often took the longer way, the difficult path. He lived in the liminal places, always imagining and open to what spirit might be doing. So that what was and what is can be changed to what can be. Because you see, you and I, in this whole world, are always in the process of becoming. I used to think it's creation something that happened back then. But it's happening right now. Every moment is a moment of creation. And it's not a geographic thing, it's how we look at things. We've all been conditioned to how we behave in church. And the way we've been conditioned is we've been conditioned to come to church and we're friendly and we say hello and tell a few things, our greatest hits to one another. But really, we've never in church for many, many years gotten to know each other at a deep and personal level. I mean, people have been serving on church boards for 30, 40 years. Most of them have never shared a story of vulnerability, of struggle, or of some breakthrough, of you know, something that worked out in the family. They don't share it because they don't want people to know that the family like such and such. We carry shame around us. We carry a worry that people are going to judge us. When the opportunity is to really get to know that person beside us or in front of us or behind us, then we become closer. Then we become more supportive of each other, and then there's more joy. But that's not how we're conditioned to be. We're afraid of getting close. We're afraid of sharing our struggles and problems. We're used to 
dress it up and pretend everything's fine. And then, you know what I've noticed over the years? If people get into a mess, they stop going to church. And then, if the mess gets cleared up later, then they'll start coming back again. Just the opposite of what church should be. This should be the place we can go to with our messes and know we're just going to be loved back and loved back to health and strength. Well, everybody was afraid of the lepers. Not because the disease was as terrible as everybody thought it was. But because people were too afraid of lepers to study the disease until hundreds and hundreds of years later. So the lepers had to leave their families and their communities and live in leper colonies, kind of like refugee camps. But Jesus wasn't afraid. And when the lepers came to Jesus asking for help, he helped them by challenging them to go to the priests to abandon them from their town and to reclaim their place in society with their families as whole people, not deformed, not second class, not misfits. And I don't know whether you notice this, the miracle happened as they were on their way. So, you see, the stories in the Bible are symbolic and, and they're written through intention. So in the story, it's not like she's looking at the young, so they go, oh wow, I'm here. He said, now go back and show the priest. No, no, no. He said, go back and show the priest. And they were healed as they began the journey. Inner healing always requires us to engage, to have some faith, to have some hope. The miracle happened as they went on their way. They took the risk of going back. And then noticed they were getting a hold of the man. There are many reasons as there are people for us to think of ourselves as second class citizens to worry that we're not enough, that we're not good enough. And there may be no cure for what we're going through, but healing. Inner healing is always available. Healing of our fears. Healing of our shame. Healing of our worries. Healing of whatever it is that's keeping us from being whole and filled with peace and faith and gratitude. Whatever keeps us from being that positive force in motion, there's healing for that. Jesus helped the lepers redefine who they were, to rediscover who they were, that they were whole, they were healed. Their lives were completely different to them. Their isolation their self-loathing, their fear, their loneliness, their sense of being a victim was gone. Has somebody helped you in your life like they've helped me? Has somebody helped you see something of value in you that you might not even been aware of, that you weren't sure of? Has somebody helped you mature and become more whole? Has someone encouraged you to try something new and believe what we do for one another. Sometimes we're Jesus in the story. Sometimes we're the lepers. And sometimes we're the priests judging. But we get to be Jesus and we get to be Jesus to one another. But we often, when a problem's worked out, just move on to our next problem. And we tend to just move on and not take a little time to realize how blessed we are. Some of them might have been thinking, well, you know, i got to thank Jesus for this. I'll do it later. And then they never get around to it. Or, or i got to get home and share the good news. Some were thinking about anything other than seeing their partner, their kids, their parents again. Some were caught up in worry. Will my friends still want me? What's if my partner's found somebody new? I bet one of them was focused on going to that priest and just say, ha, 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 I'm healed now. Some of them couldn't wait to get a job again, get some financial security. There's so many distractions, there's so many things that are on our mind. But the point of the spiritual journey is to set aside our distractions regularly and realize how God has blessed us and loved us through one another. <coughs> Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, two of the richest people in the world, have a spirituality that's enabled them not to be distracted by their money and empire. They live with an awareness that most wealthy people seldom have. That as fun as making money is, there's nothing more fun and satisfying to the soul 
and spending it in ways that change lives and bring healing. Usually it's the poor that get it. The highest per capita giving to charity in Canada is Newfoundland, which has the lowest per capita income. So in our story, did you notice it was the Samaritan who came back to say thanks? Those who had it toughest often are given the gift of the greatest appreciation and joy. The Samaritan was a leper twice over. He had a disease that was despised, and he was a member of a race that was despised. But because he made time to reflect on the enormity and the gift that Jesus gave to him, and the generous love that was given to him with it, he received the blessing of increased faith that the others didn't receive. If we want to have faith, if we want to have the courage to be up to what God in life is calling us to be up to, we're going to have to have resilience and we'll get that as we reflect and give thanks for the past blessings of life. As I've said in the Jewish Hebrew language, walking forward means to walk forward backwards so that we can always be aware of God's activity and help and sustaining grace in our lives in years before. So that then we have a confidence to face what lies ahead. Mary Jo Redding in her book Radical Gratitude writes, the craving for more is inversely experienced in the sense that what we have is never enough. To illustrate this, she mentions Howard Hughes, who was once asked how much money it would take to make him happy. Knowingly, he said, just a little bit more. She points out that the only solution to feeling like we have enough is to lean into a life of radical gratitude. Spirit calls us back to what God has done for us and through us. Think of the times we've been able to bless him. Think of what we've invested in our kids and they're invested in our grandkids. We need to be aware of how we are agents of the divine. We are a part of God's hand of love. Wow, that gives us a good feeling. That makes us feel grateful. That just picks us right up, giving thanks for the victories that have come to us and that we have been able to give to others. But we tend to rush from blessing to anxiety. From good fortune to forgetting about the needs of others. And in doing so, we lose our power and the meaning of life. Whatever we enjoy today, we enjoy because others have paved the way for us. Newton said that if I can see further than other people, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. All our rights, all our freedoms have come to us by others, minorities who had no power, but who stood up for what was right and somehow with the work of spirit was able to overthrow empires of money, of greed, of guns, and move us toward greater human rights. Nothing is as satisfying and good for our mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual health than giving thanks. Gratitude releases the power of faith and hope of love. I finished with a story I enjoyed from Fulton Osler. He was a famous American journalist and mystery writer, born in 1893. He tells a story about his nurse. An African-American by the name of, get this, Anna Marie Cecilia Sophia Virginia Avalon Thessalonians. That's quite a name. Anna was born a slave on the eastern shore of Maryland. She taught Fulton his greatest lesson, the lesson of a thankful heart. I remember her as she sat at the kitchen table in her house, he wrote, the hard brown hands folded across her starched wrapper, the glistening black eyes lifted to the whitewashed ceiling and the husky old whispering voice saying, much obliged, Lord, much obliged. Once he asked her about her ability to be thankful and to pray th thanks, prayers of thanks so often. You know, she said, it's a funny thing about being thankful. It's a, it's a game an old colored preacher taught me to play. It's looking for things to be thankful for. You don't know how many of them you pass right by unless you go looking for them. Take this morning. I woke up there laying 
there, lazy like, wondering what I've got to be thankful for now. And you know what? I can't think of anything to thank them for. And then from the kitchen comes the most delicious morning smell that ever tickled my old nose. Coffee. Much obliged, Lord. Much obliged for the coffee. Much obliged for the smell. There came a time when Ulster went through a very trying and bitter period of discouragement and failure in his life. He said the memory of Anna's spirit of thanksgiving gave him a handle to work with, and it literally pulled him up and out and onward. Remembering, taking some time to remember Anna, returning to the scene of how she blessed him, gave him the faith to keep on. Some years later, he was called to the bedside of the dying man, old, crippled, feeble, standing beside her and noting her hands, knitted together in pain. He wondered, what would she be thankful for now? She opened her eyes, smiled, and the last words she spoke were, much obliged, Lord, for such fine. Among the simple blessings of life we so thoughtlessly take for granted, we too need to take some time to say, much obliged for everything. Let's be honest.